then okay. I see myself talking and then... <laughs> yeah, it's already hard hearing myself talking. But anyways, um, thank you for having me. So when Linda approached me with her email, you look through and it's, you know, it's one of the emails you get a lot when you have people requesting and asking you, oh, could you come and do a little speech or could you do a demo or could you do this? And it goes in a business like we have, especially when you provide chocolates and pastries, it's a never ending story. What was different here was um, for me the fact that it's um, a room full of young people who are all type A, is that the way I should read it? <laughs> uh, of, 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 yeah, of young peers who, who would love to share and, and would love to get inspired and I've been or I'm still in, in those shoes and um, when I've been invited to teach at World Pastry Championships and it was about dessert making and chocolate making, I learned pretty quick that it wasn't actually only about the dessert and chocolate, it was all the things in between the lines where people were much more interested in. So we would be wherever the, the championships are, they were mainly in Las Vegas or in Phoenix, in one of the huge hotels, and I would do this dessert class um, with, a full, with a room full of young professionals and experienced professionals, so it was a good mixture, and so there would be one conference room after another, and all the other chefs, what they would do, they would teach recipes, and I felt like, well, the recipe is one thing, you know, um, here it is, and I can give it to you, and I will demo that recipe. But I think what is much more important, how do you get to that recipe, and how do you get that passion and that interest into actually creating that recipe? And, um, and I found that was a much bigger success and a much bigger interest than just being there and showing off, in this case, how good of a technical professional I am. So for me, sharing um, a little bit our story with you, hopefully, is inspirational and hopefully you can walk away from it and say like yeah now i know a little bit what's going on behind the doors so for some of you who don't know us um, um i came to vancouver 17 years ago uh, via switzerland i am from germany originally but at that time i worked in, in switzerland and i was a young mid-20 year pastry chef and worked in a little two-star Michelin uh, restaurant that was recruited by Four Seasons Hotels uh, to come to Canada. And at that time, my English was very poor, and I'm like, always had the kind of American dream where you think of, you know, you're, as a European, you're a young 20-year-old, and you want to go to North America and the country of um, the unlimited opportunities, etc. So I was right away, oh yeah, I'm going to go. So it took longer than I thought because uh, there was a visa issue. They first wanted to get me to Chicago. And uh, I told my, my chef I used to work for, and I said, like, well, whenever they're ready, I would like to stay another season in St. Moritz where, where I worked, and then I would love to explore that. And I'm from a fourth generation um, uh, family business. So that means my great grandfather was a baker, my grandfather was a baker, my father was a pastry chef and restaurateur in a small little town in the Black Forest. So that's where I grew up. 2,500 people. And my parents were running their cafe, which had 130 seats. So actually much bigger than the two stores <laughs> we have, you know. But uh, they didn't turn it around so fast. So with as many people. But, um, and, and that's all I pretty much knew. So I grew up in, in the business, even though I've never been taught by my father how to make pastries. So, he always thought, he said like, well, no, 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 when, at, at that time, I was 15, just turning 16, and in Germany you can leave high school at grade 10 and start your um, second, um, um, how, how would you call it, yeah, you start your apprenticeship. So that's your second line of education, or you can go until grade 13 into high school and then you can go to university. So. I was done with school at grade 10 and I was like all cheered up of uh, working away from home as a young pastry cook and do my apprenticeship there. And so for a 15, just 16 year old kid nowadays, so to speak, it was uh, quite a venture to know I, I had a moped, I packed up my moped with the clothes and stuff and I drove for two hours um, to my new place where I got to live all by my own and we're gonna start work next week. And um, 
that was a kind of scary, but it was a kind of exciting. And so he always believed that I should learn from somebody else what he actually thought this person is better for me to learn and, um, and go there. So that young experience or that experience at that young age, I think, um, put a big, forms you for your life, you know? And so nowadays, I, I think when we grow up as, um, as, as young adults, I, I realize now you're in, in your mid-twenties when you start thinking of your careers. At my time, it was like you were in your mid-teens and you were starting with your careers. And there was never a question of looking back and say like, oh, was this the right thing to do? This is what you're gonna do and this is what you're gonna do, you know? And so I try to give that experience a little bit further to all the people who enter our industry, you know, who enter in their mid-twenties, sometimes in their early thirties, and it's like, make a commitment, stick with it, do the best you can do, and things will fall in place. So often it becomes this kind of instant gratification and we want that fast success. It didn't happen in, in, in my world, you know, and I think it was, a, it was a good thing because it started creating uh, a solid foundation. And before I gotta tell you a little bit more how <coughs> things developed for myself going into business and creating what we do, I speak quickly for the people who don't know us so they have a little bit of an idea of what our our business is about. So and then we roll then we roll back into it. So um, now we are first how we um, uh, work with our co-workers and, uh, and be excited about it because there's, there's so much to do. And that is easier said, or, or that is easy to be said as long as you know that your model, what you're in, is working. So nine years in, uh, for the last four years, our business, we control to be at the same, so we have 40 staff, we have the two stores. We used to have only one store, and we served a lot of hotels uh, across North America with our chocolates, which was the initial success story of, um, being the exclusive supplier to the most luxurious hotels from here to Maui to Kona to Texas to New York City um, to uh, Boston uh, so that's the way it actually started and and then we did a lot of local hotels with the pastries and desserts and we found out that the retail customer is what we are focusing on because I, I felt it's the most rewarding and it's the most demanding at the same time so we switched our energies of focusing on two of the two stores, one on Kitsilano, and then we have our original store in North Vancouver, which is more hidden even the one on Broadway in Kitsilano is like the slowest block on Broadway, basically when where the businesses start. But um, I felt there was a good karma to that area, and I, um, we decided to, to move in there. The North Shore store, you can't even get there unless you look under Google Maps and you have a car to drive here. It's on a dead end street. And that's where our uh, bigger bigger kitchen is. Um, so, and that's what it is. Uh, and that's where we kept it at. Our business generates about um, $6 million in sales with the 40 people we have. And uh, we are truly uh, an artisan business. So to track back a little bit, and I would also like to encourage any one of you at any time to raise your hand if you have a question you know I said like oh but then what happened I hope that throughout that speech and the little time I have that I can answer as uh, as many questions just of what I want to share with you but if there's anything you feel desperate to to ask and to say then don't hesitate to um, to have that I think an interactive kind of um, uh, discussion uh, you know could be quite beneficial to other, to, to every one of us um, then at the end, I think there will be some time set aside at about two o'clock where we can um, have questions and answers uh, anyways. So tracing back a little bit. Um, so I did my apprenticeship starting with 16 and um, went to this crazy, amazing, but holy, he was such a crazy chef. You know, when you watch the Food Network at times, and I always say like, yeah, that's all for TV. Actually, it's not. <laughs> like they are that crazy, you know. There's guy chefs out there. They're just that crazy, and I don't know if it's the passion what leads them to it, or if it's the personality what what led them to it. But I started my first workday. I was so nervous. I had a little room above the shop, 
where the owner also stayed, and I kind of loved that story because it still scares me. So I could not fall asleep that night because I was nervous. I was 16 years old, and it was my first day, so I fell asleep at 3 a.m. I could not hear the alarm at 5 a.m. So somebody runs up and says, like, are you Thomas in there? And I'm like, oh. And I wake up and I'm like, yes, I say, well, you are late. And I'm like, oh my God, my first day. <laughs> <laughs> and I run down, poorly dressed because I was so nervous, I didn't even know how to button my chef's jacket anymore. So I go in the kitchen and there was the, the crew of, of young chefs in there, plus the owner, and he was already not talking a lot to me. And I'm like, very intimidated because you don't have that natural confidence. Where to, where would you get it from when you start your first day with sleeping in? Hello. <laughs> so it, got, it actually got worse. So I got up um, into the kitchen and there was a kind of a silence. And in Germany, probably a lot like in Taiwan, there's a lot like clockwork. You know, this is the way we work and this is the way we do things. And so my first task was um, that Thomas prepared the fruits of the day. So I had to start peeling apples. No problem. Anyone can peel apples, you know. There were a certain expectation from the owner on me. I knew that because, oh, he comes from a business. I can expect more from him. So that didn't help the cause either. So they put me in the corner with a case of uh, Boscop, a beautiful apple from the harvest. And they give me this apple peeler. And this apple peeler is only for right-handed. So it's not the multi-use apple peeler. It's one which has a little uh, notch in there, and you can only use it on your right hand, and I'm left-handed. Oh. So everything I do in my life, except for playing soccer, I do left-handed. So I go in the corner, and she gives me this apple peeler, and I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> didn't want to ask, go like this. And it's a skill to peel an apple, and especially it, it was one with this semi-flexible plate. So I'm going like, ah, uh, do you have an apple peeler, like one of those? And she says, no. And uh, so I had to do it. So the chef comes by and said, like, what's the problem? I said, like, oh, I'm left-handed, and I think this is only for right-handed uh, people to peel apples. And he loses it. Like, it was, by then it was 6.45 in the morning. <laughs> and, and he loses it in a real, you know, Gordon Ramsay fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Holy beep, you know, I can here. And um, uh, if I would have known that you're left-handed, I would have never hired a left-handed person because, you know, I don't believe in it, you know, everything is different for them, which we all know they're more creative and... <laughs> <laughs> so, so he would be, he would be really scared out of me. And, uh, and uh, so, I, I can't recall the details, how much I was starting to sweat and I uh, made it through the day. So I got a kind of crushed going up into my room at night, no confidence of, of anything, but I knew one thing, I said, like, I'm gonna show them. So I got up, uh, when the kitchen got dark, I think it was probably 2.30 in the morning, I got up, I went into the dark kitchen, turned the light on, took that right-handed apple peeler, started peeling the case of apple, took me double as long as anybody else, triple as long, did it the second day, I did it the third day, and after the fourth day, I was beating the apprentice who was there for three years in peeling the apples with my right hand. <laughs> so so I, I, I gained a little bit of that confidence back and, um, and went through three hard years of, of apprenticing under a German taskmaster. So, and um, in retrospect, I have to say it was the best thing that ever happened to me, you know. But that was possible because I was a kid who you can still mold and you can form, you know. Nowadays, when we teach and when we guide uh, people, uh, I have the complete opposite uh, uh, opinion. First of all, we deal with much more mature people. I don't want anybody to go through what I went through, even though I think I've benefited from it greatly. Um, so I wanted to make sure that uh, we have a different approach of, uh, of how we train people and how we also respect them and how we make them the best they can be. So after three years of apprenticeship, Normally there's a routine in, in Europe as a young pastry cook, um, you start, then you, then you get your um, apprenticeship paper, so you are a certified pastry cook at that time, and um, you have to go through, through a, um, uh, what do you call it, a test at the end, you know, which is theoretical and practical, and of course it was my aim um, throughout those three years 
to never ever disappoint my boss again. And so I was able to go through that and become first uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the province and then become first in the country of, uh, of the adventure world. And I think it was just to never ever disappoint, you know. So it, it stuck so deep with me. And um, I learned that, you know, being first is not always what matters, you know. But what matters is, is the intention and the desire of what you want to do, you know. And often I get asked, um, actually very often if I do teach with praise to chef um, uh, individuals, the word passion comes up, you know. And if I think back, was I passionate by entering the field of pastry? No, I wasn't. I was just like, this is what you're going to do. And I was not asking questions, and I wanted to do the best I can do. But passion is something you can actually fuel yourself with. You know, It is something where, don't be disappointed. Say, I don't know if I'm so passionate about this. No, you are in charge, I learned, of becoming passionate about something. And what that drives you is really up to you. You know, for some it's, you know, they go on a bicycle and, um, and they want to be the fastest they can be and, and that's what makes them passionate. And others go on a bicycle, they say like, oh, I have a passion for cycling because I love being in the nature. You know, somebody wants to become a pastry chef and, um, and, and what drives them. Like for me it was when I realized that there's people, they come and they start knocking on your shoulder and say like, yeah, that was amazing or I really liked it, you know, I got a kick out of making people happy, you know, and it made me a kind of a commitment to others where I said, I don't want to disappoint them, I, I want them to say, like, yeah, that, that looks beautiful, and that tastes great, you know, I'm not quite sure if I always achieve it, but that's what made me feel, I created that passion and that commitment to society in, in what we do, and, um, and, and that's what would I, would, I would like to inspire to anyone and say, like, you know, find a way of what you know that, that that fuels a, a real deep interest and that really makes it so much easier for you to achieve that because you love that, you know? And that comes up a lot from here, from your attitude, you know, from how you look at your profession, how you look at your goals and what drives you through them. And I feel I'm blessed because I am in a profession where I feel I haven't worked, at, well, it's not completely true, but I often say like, yeah, I. I love to go to work, you know, I love to see my people we work with, I love to see our customer, and I just love the work, you know. But it wasn't like this right from the beginning. I think it came more and more and more with the choices I made. So after my apprenticeship, I worked in different places for a year, and it's a common thing. Here, I don't like it anymore. If somebody comes and leaves us after a year, you know, it's like, oh, stay a little longer, you know. But some people, you know, in Europe it's a tradition. Here I think I'm, uh, I'm glad it's not so much because we have a lot of stuff we work with there here for three, four, five, seven, nine, ten years with me now. You know, and then there's a transient kind of um, uh, uh, stuff too. So, so you work a year here, a year there, and after another three years, you are, so six years of professional experience, you are entitled to go to master school. So that's another education. What you need in, in this case in Germany to get a master's degree in pastry and business. And with that master's degree, only with that master's degree, you are allowed to start your own business. So the government wants to make sure that if you start your own business, you are a real pro. Because if you're not a real pro, we don't want you to start your own business. <laughs> so, and they want that you're a real pro in what you do with your baking. And we want you also to be good with uh, what you do with um, um, with the people you surround yourself with, so there's psychology, leadership, and all those things uh, included in that kind of education. And um, once you do uh, that master's diploma, where it's about a 60, 40, 60 percent pass it, 40 percent don't pass it, um, success guaranteed. Then you can start your own business. So I did that at a young age of 22, which. I don't know if it was too early or not, but while I did it, my, old, my, my chef I used to work for at that time asked me to come back to his shop. I was the pastry cook when I left, as the pastry chef when I came back. So I was 22 years old and I felt like I'm not ready for that. So I told him, I said, I don't think I'm ready to be your pastry chef. There were 14 chefs in the kitchen. 
12 of them were older than me. So all, probably 11 were older than me, some were double as old as I was, or almost triple as old. So they were in their mid-40s and there was a baker that he was in his early 60s. And I'm like, I can't stand there and tell him what to do. You know, he's gonna laugh at me. So I said, I don't think I'm ready. And he said, yeah, yeah, you are ready for this. You come and you do this. And so I gave in and, um, and I took that pastry chef position. And um, you would have to ask him and everybody else around it, you know, uh, how that worked out. So I did it for two and a half, or almost two and a half years. But after two years, a friend told me, oh my God, you look like, to use words here. Use. You, look, you look like not so good. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean with that? They said, like, yeah, you have rings around your eyes and you work yourself to death. And, and I said, like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, anyway, so I came to the conclusion that uh, as much as I enjoyed it, it was, it was a lot of stress if you're not ready, you know. And it didn't appear to probably most of my co-workers that way, but I felt I go to work under so much pressure every day to perform and to lead by example, and I was like 22 years old, so 23 at that time. So I decided I want to explore more of what the industry offers, and um, growing up in a pastry shop, patisserie, chocolate shop, uh, is one part, but then there are the hotels, which I've never done, and then there are the fine dining restaurants, which I've never done. So, and then I, that's a part of the choice, is what I spoke earlier. So I made that kind of decision, say like, okay, if I can find a hotel in a great town where they ski and have beautiful mountains, then that would be awesome. So, so I, I found this beautiful five-star hotel in the, in the Swiss Alps, and uh, because I love to ski and I love the nature and I love the mountains, I guess that's the reason why I'm here uh, on one part. So, so I thought like, well, that's a good combination. And um, so I went to Davos in Switzerland, that's where the World Econom Economic Forum is every uh, year. So I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, it's like where the biggest uh, um, ec economics people meet, including presidents and uh, big business CEOs, and, uh, and they discuss the world strategy of what's going on. It's a small ski town uh, in the heart of Graubünden in Switzerland. And, I worked in this beautiful five-star hotel to learn different areas of my profession, which I was very excited about, you know, making uh, buffets, carving ice, doing sugar sculptures, uh, doing plated desserts. And I did that for a year. And one of the um, uh, co-workers uh, introduced me to an amazing little restaurant in St. Moritz. Probably most of you have heard of St. Moritz, which is a very luxurious, exclusive ski resort a little bit further south um, uh, in that area. So we went there for dinner and it was this amazing small little restaurant that had two Michelin stars. So for some who are not aware of Michelin, Michelin is the hardest uh, and most highest acknowledged uh, rating for, for world-class restaurants. So it's so world-class that we don't even have it in Vancouver. You know, it's a very European thing. It's in Asia, it's just started in New York. Um, and they give three stars for the best in the world, and there's a handful who have three stars, um, uh, in a, not even in a country, there's l less than a handful in, in countries other than France. And, um, and then there's two stars, which is almost the best in the world, and then there's one star, which is pretty amazing. And, um, and they have very rigid type of... Uh, guidance and rules how they uh, evaluate their restaurant. So it was a little two-star restaurant, and I went there for dinner, and I was so impressed about the beauty of the plate and the perfection of the service, and now this is another part. So I tried to learn about myself, who I am, and what drives me. So to any one of you out there, if you can answer that question, you are far ahead of anybody else, because most people, search for that to the rest of their lives. So they never figure out who they really are and what really drives them and what really gives them energy. You know, we are so often, and you can't blame any one of us in that because we are so often driven by outside sources. It might be your parents tell you to do this. It might be, oh, that looks interesting if I take up this profession, you know, because 
there might be uh, good benefits or there might be uh, a good pay wage or it comes with a sports car, I don't know. You know. So you have to find out for yourself what excites you, you know, what makes you do that without anything below that, you know, without anything uh, artificial what drives you, you know, where I say like, yeah, I, I go to work simply because I love doing this, you know, and then I get paid for it, that's even better, you know, so, so I figured out when I was in that restaurant that I just loved how they plated the food and how perfect the service was and, and how special you felt and, and the skills were, were on such a level that I was like, oh my God. So I came back to the hotel in Davos with my friend and uh, I was so motivated. So I wrote them a letter and I put my resume in there. If they're ever looking for somebody in the pastry kitchen, I would love to join them. And two weeks later, they replied and said like, we would love to have you for an interview. So I'm like, even more excited, so I create this cake and I make a sugar centerpiece on it, um, like blown sugar, airbrushed, and it was really delicate. And, um, um, and then we drove it over there, and I said, Yeah, I have a little treat for the kitchen, you know. And I learned another lesson of how hardcore kitchens are. So I'm like, They must look and say, like, Oh wow, this guy is probably good, you know. Now the chef in the kitchen. I could, I could go a little bit deeper in that story, and he was. I met him after, obviously afterwards. So if he would order five beers, he would have to order it like this because he had only three fingers left. So he had tattoos from here down, then business in the front, party in the back. So short in the front, his hair long in the back. So he looked anything like a chef in a three star in a two star Michelin restaurant. And I'm like, how can that be? You know, <laughs> after I figured out that he lost part, most of his fingers by being, um, I think it's called stoned in his early 20s <laughs> and working and working in a sawmill and cutting his fingers off. I couldn't get that either, that he can be in one of the best restaurants in Switzerland and guiding the kitchen. So that's the, not the owner, that's the chef. There's the chef owner too. And he was there for five or, or seven years already. So when I was there. And uh, so I learned, again, so don't judge people by their covers, you know, because you never know. And this guy was amazing. He was an amazing chef, and he was, like, driven, and he would drive any one of us like nobody would ever drive a human. You know, he would come at 5 o'clock. We all lived close by in little apartments, and he would come at 5 o'clock, knock on the doors, and say, like, okay, out of bed. And I'm like, I finished service at 1.30 this morning. I don't care. Out of bed. Put your shorts on, we go on a mountain bike ride. And then he organized champagne breakfast on top of a mountain in, in St. Moritz to see the sunrise. And then we were down at 8.30 and then we worked until 1 in the morning again. <laughs> so when I brought that cake, I didn't know what happened, but they showed pictures. I brought the cake, I was in the restaurant, and the, sh and the chef owner brought it in. They took the sugar piece away, they went with their fingers in, <laughs> they went like this, and they all ate it with their fingers. And like in this respect to, what does he think? You know, so so there was another that probably only happens in Europe. So I, <laughs> yeah, there was another experience I just couldn't believe it. But anyways, I got the job and I loved it, and it was uh, another really kind of a hardcore experience um, uh, being from a civilized hotel where everything is kind of organized. You are kind of a of a Vancouver Whistler. Um, what's the train called? The, there's a beautiful train going up to Whistler. Whistler yeah, the mountain. Whistler Mountaineer. The Whistler Mountaineer. So it's a safe track thing, and you go into the Ferrari Formula One race track in Monte Carlo. So it was like, oh my god, it was so crazy and high demanding, and um, and working without ever putting your head up, and your work was never good enough. But I kind of enjoyed it, you know. So I was proud to be in that environment where there were a lot of demands, and um, and where your work was never good enough. But at the end of the day, you were still proud of what you did, you know. So I was there for two years, and then I got the offer to come to Canada, and then I went from. Everybody always said, if you make it here, you make it anywhere. So I said, like, okay. Whew. I can go anywhere now. So anyway, so I, came to, so I came to the Four Seasons in Vancouver. 
And, um, and that's now probably the interesting part um, uh, for you guys. I arrived and I got picked up by the fellow who stands when you come out from the international <laughs> and it says like, has your name on it, you know, Thomas Haas for season one. I was like, oh, I'm getting picked up by a, by a, by a, by a driver. And so I went into the hotel, I checked in. The first day, the first moment, I then met my future wife, who was working in the front there, uh, at the front office, Lisa. And um, and she says, like, yeah, we have you for two weeks in the hotel, and then you've got to make room. And I'm like, oh, OK. So I got uh, I set up in the hotel uh, at the Four Seasons, and I felt like I was treated like royalty, while I was only on the bottom line. I'm just a, a guy who cooks, you know. I was in the hotel for two weeks, couldn't find an apartment. And I also remember that it was uh, November 2nd. I think it has not stopped raining ever since. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, I have to go and find an apartment. I mean, it was so drenched. I, I came with a mountain bike, a wooden box full of books. Uh, I brought some of my special tools. I know I already can't get here. Some clothing, some chef's clothes, and that was basically it. So I took my mountain bike and I went through the West End, then I drove over the bridge, which I felt at the time I was close to being killed. <laughs> because there, there, there weren't the bike lanes, like there are over Lionsgate now. And the wind was gusting, and I don't think it ever stopped raining. So I found my apartment, and, um, and I fell really in love with the city. Um, it was December 26, probably my really first day off, where a colleague of mine who worked in room service, I said, let's go to Whistler. And it was that one night where it got really cold and it snowed like crazy. And it was blue sky in the morning and we drove the Sea to Sky Highway. And every little island coming out of, of the water there when you go Sea to Sky was white. Like everything was white and then there was the ocean. And that picture was like, oh my God, I never want to leave here. So. So that was, uh, was my first kind of experience. And I sure kept an eye on that girl who checked me in, um, <laughs> which I made sure not much longer um, uh, we had a relationship. And uh, after being three years happily in Vancouver, throughout that time, I kept on doing, that's another thing I want to share, I kept on doing the things I always believed in what is in my control. And that was get up, do the best you can do, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. So often I would sleep in the hotel in the kitchen for two hours. I had this little area that was the oven, and there was the proofer, and there was a little corner. And I was doing dinner service for, at that time, was Chartwell, the restaurant. And then finished at midnight. And I was working on a centerpiece. And I know at 6 o'clock there was a big breakfast for a big company. And I felt like, well, four hours by the time I'm home. And I just nap in the, in the corner there, you know. So I, I would sometimes not go home. I would just sleep for a few hours, and the morning crew would come in and they say, like, "Are you crazy?" And I'm like, "No, no, it was just no point of going home." And uh, often I said, "You know, I have a choice of going home at seven o'clock and nothing to do, and put my legs up and watch TV, or I do something." I love to do, which is working with chocolate and working with sugar and prepare a centerpiece for another event. And I get more satisfaction out of that. So I kept on trying to learn about myself, what I love to do and what what drives me, you know. So and, uh, and if I keep on understanding that, then, uh, then work is actually not that hard, you know. I can tell you other stories where I do, ha where I had days where I said, I don't know if that work ever ends, but in general, that rule has, has worked pretty well, and that was quite an effort to, to find that out. Even now, later, when we, when, when we started the business and we grew, as I said at the beginning, of um, being constantly asked by people, oh, why you don't franchise? Oh, why you don't grow? Why you don't open one here? Oh, why you don't open one there? You know, and I'm like, I don't think I would be happy. But that's only for me. You know, if I would have a different entrepreneurial instinct, which is just as equally good it doesn't matter. There could be a hundred Thomas Haas patisseries. They might not be the same than what they are now. Definitely not the same. But that's in the eye of the beholder, you know. So I don't differentiate that one is better than another. What I say is this is what really 
matter to me, you know. And this is what I'm convinced of what is a source of, of my happiness and also of my health. Because I don't need to do anything I don't feel like I, I want to do, you know. And um, initially, that's a little bit hypocritical since our business is successful in, in many, in all ways. I was never driven by money. Never. Like it was, we come to that in a few, in a few minutes, but that never really mattered. When we started the business and then we built the little factory we have in the North Shore and we bought the building, I never rented because that's an old, I don't know, conservative outlook on, on business too. Um, uh, I never had a business plan, you know, and all I knew is like, I, I know I, I have a good common sense and, um, and if I work hard and do uh, good work and um, hopefully uh, things will fall in place and in this case it did, it did, fall, in, it did fall in place and uh, so coming back um, uh, to my time to my time in Vancouver, uh, I also wanted to ensure throughout the three, three years I was here, I loved meeting people of the same interest, people who have passion for their work, so I got to get out of the city. So I was intercompany wide, I was saying, who is the best place you have at the Four Seasons Hotel Company? And they would say, oh, we have a guy in Chicago, he's amazing, he's a French guy. And we have a guy in New York, oh, he's amazing. So I would contact them. And they would say, hey, I have a week of vacation. I want to come and visit you and I want to work with you. And they said, yeah, yeah, come. And the, the fellow in Chicago was amazing. He was like open to share. And uh, really we shared that philosophy of sharing. You know, sharing your knowledge, sharing what you have because it will make us all better and stronger. Instead, what there is a common practice in our industry and probably in a lot of industries where people try to hide, they try to hide. Their, their knowledge, they try to hide their recipes, they try to hide everything because out of their own insecurities. You know, and I, I hate that. I don't want to go one day in a grave and take, what can I take with me? No, I want that I was able to share it with everybody, you know, so that um, it made at least, I made at least a little bit of an impact in that regards. And has it ever harmed me? I don't believe so. No, I think the good karma rather makes you flourish through that. And so I would ex um, get exposure of, of going to places like that. And, um, and they would say like, oh, you know, why you don't do a competition in New York? And it's called America's Pastry Chef of the Year. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, 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 my, my, uh, my assistant um, is doing it. And she prepared now for a year for it. And it was November again. And the competition was in January. So. Three weeks later, um, I emailed him and said, like, hey, I just got accepted for that competition. He said, like, oh, great, so you have over a year to prepare. And I said, like, no, 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 it's the one in six weeks. You know? <laughs> he says, like, are you crazy? <laughs> and I'm like, no, why? Said, why? You need a year to prepare for that. That's a big competition. And I'm like, ah, oh, six weeks is enough. And that's the way if there would be people I work with, they would be here to say, like, yeah. I like the more pressure, the better I I think I, I, I can perform. So, so, but that was a lot of, so actually it was like, oh shit, that's what I really have to, I really have to figure this out, how, um, how to prepare. So I would be working day and night, I would get my centerpiece together, I would prepare my plated desserts and make that special cake and find out, you know, how do I get it to New York? And um, so, anyways, long story short, I flew to New York, I was able to use the kitchen at the Four Seasons have ever been to New York? I mean, all cab drivers are crazy. You know, there's, there's like, you've got to be crazy to be a cab driver in New York. So th he comes and he sees me and he starts swearing at me and like, I don't take this blah, blah, blah down there. Are you crazy? And anyway, long story short, we made it down to the convention center. All the celebrity chefs were preparing and they had their assistants and they had little kitchens built up. And I come, I come again with my... So who's helping you? Something? Nobody. You know. So I, set, I set up my table and and I, I I did my preparation and stuff and I was on time and there was 14 tables of the 14 chefs and we have to do that preparation and set that table up and I was done had five minutes to scroll through and see all the other work 
and I saw Ed Ming's work, and um, and I looked at it and said, like, oh my God, that, that was amazing, you know. And um, but then I saw from a professional point of view, I said, like, you know, I don't think I've done so bad because I saw a lot of imperfections on other pieces and on other work and stuff. Anyway, so I go back to the hotel, fall to bed, half dead, come back at five o'clock, then they do the announcement, and then they go down, you know, and uh, best this and best that and best this, and then no name, no name, no like this. And then, <laughs> then they go to third place, no name. You know, there was only two left, you know, and then I'm like, and I got second place, you know, and I was so happy, and, and, and Ming got first place, and she was so well deserved to get first place, um, that I thought like, yeah, you know, with that little effort, so, so those experiences, they spark you, you know, they spark you, and they, uh, they motivate you, and they give you a future learning experience, so my point here is, you know, uh, take exposure, you know, be open to, to, to share, be open to learn, and be open to challenge yourself, um, uh, when you go in business or when you would like to go in business and, uh, and, and, and improve your, your knowledge. So through that, had, this had, must have had a side effect on, on, on certain things, um, which was completely unintentional. I went back to Vancouver and uh, one day I get this phone call from this crazy, uh, I get this phone call from this famous chef <laughs> from New York. And I, I heard the name before, I should have known, but I didn't, so I was in the middle of a banquet and it was like, Hello, yeah, this is Danielle, yeah, from New York, I would like to speak to Thomas. I said, yes, speaking. I was wondering if you are interested in becoming, uh, coming to New York and work with us. And I'm like, oh, um, what, what was your name? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Danielle. And I'm like, okay, can I take your number and I call you back probably tomorrow? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. So he gives me his number. And then one of the chefs come in and I went down, Danielle, New York, so and so and so. And the chef looks at the, ta uh, at the table and he's like, who wrote this down, Danielle? And I said, like, oh, I did. This fellow just called me. I should call him back about a job. You know, and he says, are you crazy? You know who that is? And I said, like, uh, <laughs> he's one of the world's greatest chefs, and he's in New York, and he had this restaurant, Danielle, and uh, um, and he just made those big headlines in national news that he's gonna open this fifteen million dollar restaurant on Park Avenue, and so this so famous chef was looking for a, and he's truly French, out from Lyon. And I don't know how well the Germans and the French <laughs> 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 uh, pastry, I don't know. And so I knew about his pastry chef a little bit more than about him. And, uh, and that was uh, a heated French ego bigger than what would fit into this room type of guy. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. So I did my research and I'm like, I'm calling back. And I was, of course, much more humble. I'm like, Oh, sorry, Chef. <laughs> I was so busy. I couldn't think straight, you know, and we would talk and we would have a good conversation. Um, I still remember I was sitting on the bed in my tiny little apartment and we had a two hour conversation about food. And it was amazing. He said, like, I don't know the guy, but it was so amazing to talk. I went to Lisa and I said, like, I don't know, I want to work for this guy. And she says, Oh, okay. So anyway, so he invited me to come to New York and do a taste. No, first he says like, uh, send me menus and pictures, and then send me menus and pictures, and then he calls me back and said like, ah, I don't know, it doesn't tell me enough. Uh, how about you come down to New York, do a tasting? If I like it and you start working with us, I pay the expenses. If I don't like it, we share the expenses. And I felt like that's fair, and I wanted that he likes it, so I'm like, I want to do this. He said, yeah, make me a couple desserts. Give me what you need. We go shopping for you for the ingredients, and um, and then you just present them to us, and then we get a better feel of your skill and your 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 type of cooking, which has to match the type of cooking what he does in, in his kitchen. So that was on a Monday conversation. By the time it was Friday, and we were talking, the menu expanded from two desserts, twelve desserts, six chocolates, petit fours, 
ice creams and so on. So he wanted the whole nine yards. <laughs> <laughs> now then I wanted to say like, are you crazy? You know, <laughs> but I didn't want to say like, yeah, chef. No problem, chef. Yes, I <laughs> so I fly down to New York, arrive on um, Chef Kennedy Airport at like 10.30. By the time I was at his old first location, Danielle, it was 11.30, and New York, 11.30, it's like, everything is busy. So I'm looking through the window and it was packed. So I'm going in and I'm shaking hands and I'm Thomas and I'm here for the tasting. And he's like in the middle of craziness in the kitchen. And he says like, look, this is the space you could have, or I can set you up at Payard, or uh, my old pastry chef who I started a pastry shop with on Lexington Avenue, and I looked at the space in this kitchen, I'm like, oh my god, I can't prepare, no, I don't know. So I said, I tried Payard, so I go up to Payard, he was still there, and he's this kind of big old French pastry chef. <laughs> like, he doesn't even look in your eyes, he would just uh, say like, yeah, but I said like, yeah, I'm coming here, and yeah, Danielle told me, what are you making? And so I showed him the menu, and then he looks at the menu, and they, they worked for a long time together, I think they respect each other, but they hated each other. <laughs> so he would look at the menu, and now it suits my English, and he says like, what the f beep is that? <laughs> you tell him to beep off, you know, <laughs> tell him to make two desserts if he doesn't like it, um, can't find somebody else, he's crazy. And I'm like, I don't know, I already agreed to it, you know. He said, okay, you can use my kitchen, but at 3.30, um, my baker's come, and you've got to go somewhere else. And that didn't help, so I went to <laughs> right away at night to get prepared. So took my suitcase again, <laughs> got another cap, and it was raining like crazy. And um, went back to, to Danielle and said, like, okay, I'm working here. So they prepared me a little table in the back, but actually quite spacious at night until the first uh, chef came in in the morning. And I started work at midnight. And um, I started doing my prep. and. Became best friends with the dishwasher and best friends with the morning dishwasher because they know how to make espressos. So I said, "Can you make me another espresso?" <laughs> and uh, and then it got busy for lunch, and uh, my table space got smaller and smaller, and got busy for dinner. And then at about ten o'clock, I had the first of the twelve desserts coming out, and they would eat it during service. And then they would they had a little office up there, and the chef and Danielle would go in the office, and they would eat it. And by two o'clock in the morning. I have everything done, and I had no idea how this ended because I heard the screaming in the kitchen and the action, and I didn't even know if they had the desserts or they dumped it in the garbage. <laughs> so, so he was up in his office at 2 a.m., and I come in and so, not like this, but like, like this, standing there, and he was signing his cookbook, and he was saying, "Welcome to the Big Apple." Of course, there is the, I'm not that big and strong, but there's a little German guy having tears in his eyes and. Kind of a dream comes true, you know. So I called, I called Lisa, and I said, like, okay, I think we're moving to New York. And then she said, oh, really? And tell me about it, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, by that time, we already had a little baby, uh, a baby on the way, I think. Oh, no, he was born. He was born in Vancouver. And so her thoughts, for me, it was like, I just want to work there. And he was like, well, we have to live there. I have to raise a child there, you know. So she wanted to know a little bit more. I had no idea. And I couldn't even care less. Like, so can we afford to live there? I said, I, never, I don't know if I get paid for it or not. You know, I just, I just, wanted, I just wanted to work there, you know. And, um, and so, so anyway, so we moved to New York, had two amazing years there. She was a single mom. And, um, but we had a second baby there, so I don't know how that happened. But anyway, <laughs> so she was a single mom and I was working six days. I think I never left after six o'clock in the morning and I came never home before midnight. But it was amazing. It was so, you know, you become, I don't know, you become addicted to your work because uh, Sometimes Danielle would say after a while, uh, there was so much pressure too, and it was a crazy kitchen, but I loved that ambition of trying always to get better at what you do. And sometimes he would say, like, go home to your family, go home, I don't need you anymore uh, at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, okay, I change, and then I change, and I look in the kitchen, and the dessert service starts at 10, it goes really crazy. And you know, you hear, oh, the president is here, or um, there's a movie star here, or this and that, and then I couldn't leave. 
So I went back into the uh, behind the kitchen counter and started helping. So was again one o'clock in the morning until until I left. But it didn't feel that bad because you know work got you so much energy. And, um, so we stayed there for over two two and a half years. After the first year, he asked me um, that he wants to start preparing another three-year visa. And um, and so we looked at each other, and and I said like you know I I would love to stay three years, but we knew after a year and a half that I do not want to raise my family there, and I'm from the Black Forest, you know I come from an area where it's like quaint and there's mountains and there's nature and you can't take that heritage fully away from you and New York was work 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 eat 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 spend spend spend. So, 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 yeah, so that's what New Yorkers do, you know, they, they don't get a kick out of running up Gross Mountain or just driving over the bridge and see the beautiful ocean there and stuff. They just, it's a different mentality. So we knew we don't want to stay there forever. And I know we want to go back to Vancouver and live our life in Vancouver and raise the family there. So I stay as long as you want me but I want to avoid for you the expenses of doing another visa. And it was amazing. You know, he respected that and he said one sentence, which I'm still laughing about, he says like, you know, I said like for me, making a commitment of being married and having children, you know, so your, your success in life cannot be only based on your success at work. And, uh, and one day when I'm in that rocking chair, you know, I want to look back and say, like, yeah, I've been a good father, I've been a good husband, I've been hopefully good at what I do, hopefully I've been a good co-worker, and hopefully I have been a good part in society. So there's a lot of things what contributes to somebody's success. I don't think it should only be what we sometimes think it's, it's the success in your, in, in your professional life, you know, whereas we sometimes base so much on it. But I think that's very shallow. So I felt like, you know, to be... That I can say that I cannot do that in New York. I would be probably a great pastry chef, and probably I, he would start a business with me, supporting it, and um, and that would be a huge success. But I would be probably without a wife, and my kids wouldn't know me. So you have to have that certain balance. And uh, and I told him that, and and he would look at me like this, like so that gives you more. You know, because for him he was so he was such a good man, and he loves his family, and uh, I know that I could see I could see that through his interactions and things. You know, he's actually divorced, but uh, and at that time, at that time, I could see that, and he is a good, passionate man with a good heart. But work was everything for him, and it absorbed him so much because you are in the center of attention. You know, like we went to movie stars and presidents and. And, and people who, who are exciting to serve, you, you, you can serve, you know. So, so that absorbed his whole kind of life. But he fully respected my decision and our relationship for the next year and a quarter actually grew better and better and better. So that still up to that date, I feel like I've never left him. You know? So we go there in October and he already he texted me and said like, you know where you go for dinner? I said, yeah, I'm coming, I promise, you know. So we still have that have the relationship like you have never left, which is great. Um, we came back to Vancouver and then I could keep it very simple. I said, like, now you can look at the website because the rest of the bio is pretty much on the website. Um, I had luck in my life. That's another thing. You know, often I could tell the story and say like, oh, which is true. I started with nothing. Like I came here with nothing. I had no help from anybody. Uh, financial help or whatever. We started with nothing but hard work and a dedication to what we do. When I came back, there is luck in life. To everyone's success, there is luck. It's just how we define it, you know. I was lucky that I came back and somebody offered me to be a consulting pastry chef for his hotel and a pastry shop they opened on, on Georgia Street. So I was right away busy, you know. And I was lucky that that pastry shop plan he had, it was called Five Senses, um, um, had no chocolates. And we needed chocolates and he didn't want to invest in a chocolate kitchen. So I said like, well, I do it my own. So I bought the necessary equipment, 
we had a little townhouse in North Vancouver. I it probably was illegal, but I, in the, I had this perfect room. The friend who found the townhouse for us, he says, like, and down there, that's your little bakery. And I'm like, are you crazy? It's a house. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I tiled it perfectly in white tiles, white floor tiles, stainless steel tables in there. And after my 12 hour shift in downtown, I would go uh, down there and it would be the little laboratoire du chocolat, you know, it was like, the whole house smelled like chocolate. So, but I would make handmade chocolates out of there in the midnight hours. That only lasted for three months. And then uh, that same fellow and friend who found the place for us to live also had a catering kitchen, which he didn't use. So we rented that and we um, uh, started making chocolates there. So for four years, I would be working day shifts for 12 hours, truly 12 hour shifts, and then would make chocolates at night from nine until two in the morning. And then I would go to bed and then I would go back to, to the city and do that. And uh, that chocolate making was actually never worked. It was so much fun and I had two girls working with me and we knew each other better than I will ever get to know my wife. I swear to God, we would be <laughs> and, and, we, and we would listen to this radio show which was, um, I don't know anymore what her name is, but she got taken off the show and it was where people call in with their problems, you know, and so she was Dr. So-and-so on the phone. Rona Ross. Here, that's her name. <laughs> Rona Ross, yeah. She was so entertaining and we would be making chocolates at one o'clock in the morning. We would be laughing of who just called in and we were like, actually, we didn't have a phone then, but we were so close of uh, taking the phone and give her a call too, you know, <laughs> to, to see what she thinks. So anyways, so yeah, yeah, so we'll be working and it was a, an amazing time and um, the, the two girls I worked with, we were so like working well together and they knew that I already worked 12 hours and they didn't. So they sent me home and I didn't want them to stay too long. So we would both leave at sometimes two o'clock in the morning. They go over second arrows, I go to North Man, but we both had the same intentions. They said like, okay, if we don't leave, he's not gonna leave. So we all leave, and I said, if I don't leave, they don't leave. So we would drive away, and we would turn around, <laughs> and we would come back to the factory, and he said, what are you doing? He said like, well, I wanna finish work. I said like, no, that's what I want. <laughs> so, so it was amazing, and um, we would do that for four years, and that was the start of, of, um, of, of that little business, which um, we would serve hotels. First was the Four Seasons Hotel in, um, uh, Seattle. Well, it was the shop at Census and I did some for some local hotels, but the chef at the Four Seasons in Seattle called and said, like, so I hear you're making chocolates now because in the industry, like often in any industry you are in, um, people know each other. So and once you work in New York and you work for one of the best chefs in the world or in that time in New York, you know, people know who, who, who you are. So it, that is luck too. So it made it much easier that people would actually call us and say like, oh, can you come down and show what you do? And so I had this little minivan, which I still have. That's another thing, you know, it's like you said, like, get rid of this chunk of car, you know, and said, it's still driving, why shouldn't I throw it out, you know? Of course I can afford another car, but do I need it? Probably not, I rather want better chocolate, you know? So, so I would load up that turquoise Fort Windstar, and it's so ugly. <laughs> and um, and I thought like because we had those books, so I had three thousand chocolates in there. I had no idea. So going over the border, the guy says anything to declare, and I said like, I just have a few chocolates with me. He didn't ask how many. Or whatever. I said okay. He waves me through until I figured out. Oh my God! If they realize that I have three thousand chocolates with me, <laughs> I'm probably in trouble. You know. So I went to the hotel, did the presentation. And um, believe it or not, they bought the whole freaking car. Like not the car, but everything. <laughs> <laughs> we are just leaving. So when I drove back over the borders, anything to the class, I'm like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was our first uh, account we had. And then that chef would call the chef in Chicago, and that chef would call the chef in Boston. And all of a sudden, after four years, we would make 20,000 chocolates at night for all those Four Seasons Ritz Carlton hotels. Then the White House calls. So we're still, you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're making the Christmas chocolates for the White House parties, you know, and, um, uh, and actually I just spoke 
with, with their chef de cuisine two days ago. They wanted to get a piece of equipment, which only a company in Vancouver sells, shipped to them via us because we make the chocolates for them. And, um, and so I, everything was set up and then there comes a call from the vitals that they are not allowed to buy Canadian. Oh. Oh. So that is not true. Well, that is not precisely uh, what it is. So they have to source a company. Because the, the equipment comes from Germany. It's called Deep Vitamix or something. Uh, Thermomix or something. And it's from uh, a company, Forwork, which I only remember because my parents' uh, vacuums and, uh, and marble uh, polishing machine is from the same company. So that company branched out and made this amazing thermal blender, uh, which apparently there's only one distributor right now in Canada, so they have to find a distributor in the US where they can buy it from, which kind of makes sense. It doesn't make sense that they buy chocolate from us. <laughs> but I like it. So I can break, and I'm not allowed to. So anyways, um, um, yeah, so we had all that that kind of uh, build up and 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 that night work. Of course, it was tiring, but it was fun, and uh, and I, you know, I tried to save as much as I could because I knew one day this is not going to last long with the space, and we need a bigger space. And by the third year, we had people, and it was an awful, it was a beautiful little kitchen in an awful industrial complex. North Van on the east side, close to Second Arrows Bridge. If you lease it, you can just say that's it. I go somewhere else. So like, I don't want to outgrow it. I just want to have it and keep it like this. Oh, we talk in three, four years. You will tell me that. Oh my God, yeah, it's outgrown now. I can't do it anymore. Not true. Ten years later, we are still in the same place, in the same business, and we have not changed that. So yeah, so that's pretty much. Um, the rest is kind of uh, history. We, we moved in there. We learned that we should probably have a little shop in the front. There might be a chance that somebody might show up at a dead end street uh, uh, in, in, in North Vancouver. And all of a sudden, that retail, that store became like within six months became so busy. First, I was the barista, and I'm still, that's why I have to go back pretty soon. So um, I was making the coffee and I said, Yeah, somebody, if I need help, I call somebody from the kitchen. It didn't last long, and um, people like that kind of idea that it's in the middle of nowhere and they have to drive there. And I like the idea because it makes us work hard to make sure that it's worth for those customers to make that detour and that effort. You know, we get often asked why you're not in downtown because I feel like in downtown I open the door. You don't need to be that great because everybody can drop in. Because you have a thousand people walking by there, and I think it's not the same than if you are somewhere where all of a sudden, after four years, you know ninety percent of your customers. You know, you recognize them, and you know. I don't remember. Sometimes I get confused with the names because there's so many names going through my head, and then I learned that some of my girls are like, "Oh my God, I don't know how they are so amazing." You know, and they give me a kick and they say like. Elena. Mm -hmm. like, okay, thanks. Hi, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, you know my name. is like, no, she helped me. <laughs> but, but it's nice to have that kind of feel of community, and you know the people, and they come on a purpose. And they are also more forgiving if you are not perfect, you know, because I think we are not perfect, you know. We try to be as good as we can be, but we are not perfect. So. And with that type of feel, you have uh, me actually goosebumps because people forgive you, you know, and you know you try harder next time to make up for it. And um, and so I learned that's another point when I said know yourself, what drives you and what fuels you. And that was another thing where I said like that makes me happy, you know. It doesn't make me happy if I have a rotating door and people come in and out and I never get to know them and uh, I never get the feel of what I want to feel to be. So, this is where we are now. Um, this is our 11th year, our third year on Broadway, and the North Shore store we have for seven years. And um, our goal is to get better as we get older, just like a good bottle of red wine. <laughs> and uh, along the way, we hope that we uh, have the help of all of our customers to keep us on track, you know. and. Um, um, that we achieved that goal and, uh, and we have fun. 
So that's a little story of what is going on and um, how, how it happened for me, you know, probably there's a little bit something you can take from, you know, there's a, a little bit of an, um, uh, an inspiration what, uh, what comes with, with uh, the words I, I shared with you. And if you have any questions, um, then please feel free and uh, ask them now because the clock is counting down. <laughs> Thank you so much. Embarrassed if you have nothing to ask because obviously, like, because I answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I guess you, you kind of kept the, the business being quite I guess, that kind of family run in that sense, in the sense that you've been yeah. there and doing all that. I made sure that my two kids are working today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, my, my daughter is amazing. Nice. She's 12 and she's still my little jewel. My son is 14. And you know, when you're 14, you know everything. <laughs> I know, I don't know, I know nothing, Taylor, it's okay. Yeah, Dad, you know nothing. I said, like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but you go to work. <laughs> yeah. How do you hope to maintain that, I guess, that, that image, you know, long, long beyond, sort of, I guess, when you, know, when you decide to... When I'm gone. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to yeah. happen. Yeah. You know, I don't know, that. because I never know. You know, that's another thing. I never know what's going to happen next, yeah. you know? like. Sometimes people think that you know everything. I tell you, I know nothing. Like, I was like doing what I'm doing best, but I had no clue. If you ask me back when I was 25, what's gonna happen with I thought I never gonna make it to 30 anyways. So I never knew, I never knew what's gonna happen with 30. And then when we started the business, like, so sometimes people, uh, this particular friend who guided me a little bit along the way said, so what's your plan? I said like, I get up tomorrow, I go to work and, uh, and see what happens, you know. So I think, I think, you know, things will fall in place. If I could say what do I want, how can I create longevity, you know, I don't think my kids will take over the business because they see in their eyes how hard their parents work, <laughs> you know. And um, uh, so they haven't realized how much fun we have at work either, you know, and that it, I truly get up. We were. I was doing a bike race in Europe um, in August, so that's my little hobby I took up a few years ago. I set myself goals beside work um, uh, to get that kind of a little bit of balance, and uh, the cycling seems to suit me kind of well. And so I have this big goal to do a race through the Alps every year, and it's like kind of a not a professional, but a really hard effort. So we took the family this year and say four days in Provence, then we drove up to Geneva, I raced through the Alps, down to Nice, they followed me every day, uh, and there were seven stages, and then we stayed outside of Saint-Tropez for four days. Three days before, I said, let's change the flight, I want to go back home. You know, I missed work, I missed the people, I missed the whole thing, it was beautiful, <laughs> but I, I missed it, so so to answer your, to answer your question, I think um, my kids probably won't, and that's fine because I would like them to do what I did, do something on their own. I think that's sometimes much easier than if you take. I mean, it, I have seen examples where second generation or third generation take over business and it has done really well. But there's nothing like it that if you build something on your own, you know, I find. You know, that doesn't speak for everybody and for every situation. So, what I would like to see is that um, with all the people we work, that earlier or later there will be that one person, I could say, you take it over, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I don't know what that would take, what that would take, um, I mean, there's many years to go. I don't want to stop working either. So I'm in my youthful 40s. So I hope I have another 40 years being strong, and then we can see where, where it's gonna go. But if I find somebody who would, go into those footsteps, has worked with me for a long time and uh, enjoys it and I think they could do a decent job. I would just love them to just take it and run with it, you know. What else? I don't want to close it and shut it up, but that's too early to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing your experience with us. This is just such an amazing 
pesto, uh, pastry shop, and uh, this is like a, how you say, it? your all your all your history uh, told us like it's about passion, passionate. You are so passionate uh, with like what you are doing. I would say that you are in a business of love because I can say like your stuff actually kind of make us like a. How, how do I put it? Like you touch people's heart with your dessert. So you put a lot of your love into your dessert. So all of us, when we actually eat your dessert, we feel love in a, in a way. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So first of all, I want to say that I say thank you thank for sharing that with us. And second of all, it's kind of like, a, I know, I don't know over here if anybody is into baking and stuff. For me, yeah. I like to do a little baking myself at home, but yeah. I never have any professional training and stuff. So. My question is like, do you have any suggestion for maybe somebody want to go professionally into this business or just like part-time uh, part baker like me at home? Is there like a website or something like a class like uh, you suggest that we can go to like a uh, very beginner way? Yeah, so it depends. Thank you. First of all, uh, it depends on your objective. So if you want to, you know, if you say that there's sometimes a difference of loving uh, to do something not under pressure, you know, or taking it up professionally. All of a sudden, professionally, you don't like it that much anymore. So there's two objectives. If if your objective in, in your in your profession is, or in, in if your objective is that you would like to get better and get more experience um, of your what you do at home, you know, there's of course there's tons of classes. There's actually schools opening up. Um, who do weekly classes where you can further your experience. You know, even that could then lead you into a base knowledge foundation where some people eventually might take it up professionally. So now for us, um, if we take people on, we only take people on who do have a professional background. Because we learned that um, somebody who has that experience um, knows they already went through that stage and not figuring out after a year, oh my God, this is crazy, I don't want to do it, you know. Because at times, in general, it is it is hard work, you know, what we do, it's artisanal, and it's like every day, you know, when you work, I'm a strong believer of the human race. So you hear a lot of people, business owners especially, say like, I love my job, but if it, would, if it just wouldn't be with the people, you know. And I'm like, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. I hear this all the time. It's like, oh, I know that staff, like we as humans, they, that, that part of the business takes probably 60% of my energy. But that's 60% of the best invested energy I can give because this is who we are, you know? And we have to believe in that. And we have to believe in all of the obstacles and the hurdles and the challenges it comes with. You know, and, and support because if we don't, then we better just go somewhere in a little in a little block square without windows and be all by ourselves. If your objective is becoming a professional, then there is uh, schools, you can pay them a lot of money and you get a crash course, you know, like Northwest Culinary, um, uh, uh, the Art Institute, I think. Or you can go to VCC, the Vancouver Community College, which is more in depth and longer, and it's government supported. Or if you wanna do it more leisurely, then you can check out any of the local little schools where Pastry Chef opened it. Um, there's one a German fellow I know who opened it in, in Richmond, actually, Markus uh, Marco Röpke, um, School of Pastry or something. You know, and then you can have more fun at home. And probably then you have so much fun at home that you want to do it for other people too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. From where do you get inspiration from these Um I think for me the easiest way to get inspiration is through work. You know, like just being in the kitchen and, uh, uh, well, I do get inspiration too if I... I don't do that a lot anymore, but I try to go every year, or at least every other year, to Paris. And uh, even though the French, anybody French? <laughs> <laughs> the French are completely overrated, but, <laughs> but Paris is pretty good, you know. And then you go down to Lyon to the Coupe du Monde, the World Pastry Championships, 
and I know my three places I want to go, so I, I get a kind of excited and inspired. Because the more, that's the same in Vancouver people, I try to help out people who open their pastry shops and be open and say, like, if you need help, you come, I show you around, I help you whatever you need. Because I love that we become a better, stronger community in our field. Like, most of them, they are like, oh no. Oh no, I, I don't, oh no, oh no, I don't. I say, are you crazy? Why not? You know? Like, I just don't get that kind of being uh, not not sharing, so to speak. So, so inspiration is dead, and, um, but probably the most active one is through work in the kitchen, you know? And so, I'm, I had a good run for spring when we started introducing the new, a, a line of new cakes. We have to be subtle too because it's a real battle. Like, I would love to do, create every day something new, but something has to give in. But that doesn't, you know, I said like, okay, let's take this dessert out. 10 minutes later, I get a phone call. I just heard you don't serve this cake anymore. I said like, no, just for the next three months. That's not possible because that's my favorite cake and you better have it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fine line, you know, so we have now our standard 12 desserts. We, I know it's very hard to ever change them and then we come up with three, new specials as we go along. And that's the easiest, I think, through work. You know, you just work and it's like, oh, I can taste this and I want to I want to have this and this texture. And uh, and we do create, actually, recipes from scratch. There's, I don't judge the chefs out there who they take the same recipe from their same pastry shop they worked 30 years ago and they still do it. And if it tastes good, and you know, it's a classic and it's well done. You can't, uh, you can't really, you know, you can't really judge that, you know. For us, I think we do have our own fingerprints on everything because as much as we are classically focused on what we do, I don't think you will find the same cake somewhere. You go to, to France or in Germany, the same, wherever in, in Europe, you find that same dessert in every pastry shop the same. And they almost taste the same. You know, where if you go classic like tap ta ta, pari bres, uh, 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 uh opera, uh, you know, so it's like those classics. So we actually, we try to create our own classics and we create recipes. People who start with us are like, yeah, really, you guys start with paper, ingredients, then I scribble down and say like, yeah, that could work. And actually, quite often, it's like the first recipe testing comes out okay, the second comes out better, and then after three or four times, um, we think we nailed it down until a customer tells us he doesn't like it. So, but, uh, but normally, what we like, we have pretty good success that the feedback over six months, we can see if customers reorder it or if it's something which is up their alley and they enjoy it. Three more questions. Oh, kiddo. Hi, um, in your case, uh, and I think in the most cases in this industry is um, you are a pastry chef first and become yeah. an entrepreneur and have a business. Um, have you heard of any success um, story of an entrepreneur who is not a pastry chef opening up uh, a pastry shop? That's a very good question. Um, so being pastry chef first, and there's lots of them, and some of them are very good, but some of them are not good with the business side, you know, and we see that in chefs often, and I see them often failing. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to touch my own shoulder, you know, in the sense of like, I know one thing that, you know, I'm terrible at business strategy and business in, in, in general, because I have no interest in it. But I think I'm very good of going with my guts, you know, and, and making decisions there, and that's a part of why what we do has worked out so successful. So people who look at me from the outside, and actually friends, they say like, oh no, he knows exactly what he's doing, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I think I don't know, nothing really, but so my decisions, I'm lucky enough that I can say like, they are common sense decisions, so the whole package has worked, and I, I love working with people, I'm at pastry chefs. They might have been good in business, but they hated people. Like I said, like why are you not in the store, or why are you not? 
I hate people. And I said, well, then, then you better don't work with people, you know. So there was an Austrian fellow on Granville, and I said, like, nobody will ever understand what you're selling here because I don't even understand what that stuff means, you know. You are in Canada now, you're not anymore in Vienna, you know, and such weird names. I said, I don't care. This is the way I do it. Two years later, he was out of business. So to answer that question, um, I think there is cases where it works. I don't know them, you know, uh, because you are, where they were really successful because you are at the mercy of the soul of your business. Mm -hmm. So that means, that means, um, and I think that also depends a little bit on the, on the place where you are, you know, uh, I don't think it's impossible, and I, I think there is somebody, well, there's a couple places I know they have very little experience, but they have that business drive, and they, one opened uh, in, in West Van, uh, she opened her bakery, and I think she's from Hong Kong, and she just loved to do baking, and put this beautiful pastry shop up, and then she, I think she got kind of scared and asked us to buy from her, and I said, no, we don't want to expand, but I saw, the beautiful design pastry shop, so there's a good business sense, and, and it was inviting and bright and everything. And then the kitchen was like, I said, like, if you get busy, you're in trouble. I said, like, how, who the hell set that up? You know, and so I invited her over to our kitchen <laughs> and said, you know, take a look how we operate and what equipment we use and how we organize ourselves because you need to be busy to pay, you, in this case, your rent and your stuff, but the way you are set up. So this comes so much back to experience. You know, sometimes people want to, oh, I did this for three years, I want to do, say, I did it for 20, 17 years until I felt, until I fell into it and I, until I felt comfortable of really saying like, yeah, I'm pretty solid. I think it takes a, a strong hurricane to push me off the edge here, you know. So I'm a believer nothing is impossible, you know, but it has to have um, um, a good, solid relationship mm -hmm. like there is actually a lot of businesses they can't afford the finances so they need somebody who affords the finances and then they partner so that seems to be more realistic um, uh, if, if somebody has that great business sense and sees an opportunity then partner with a great technician and have it solidly partnered that both are, are benef benefit uh, benefiting from the success of it. You know.